we're going to talk about a wonderful British sculptor, Barbara Hepworth. Um, her birth date was 1903, and she died in 1975. Uh, but she's, she's certainly a mover and shaker, um, you know, changing, I think, the way that, that we look at sculpture to a certain extent. Uh, she, as we said, she's a British uh, subject. I always like that. Being an American, you know, I'm an American citizen. You're a British subject. <laughs> I surely shouldn't say that. Um, but uh, she was given the, I guess, about the highest honor that a woman could be. She is a dame. Ah, uh, that would be wonderful, to be a dame. And uh, a dame commander of the British Empire. Uh, this would, the, you know, you call a man sir or lord. Uh, and uh, a woman is a dame. Doesn't have quite the same uh, uh, connotation as it did in, say, the musical South Pacific. Uh, she attended the Leeds School of Art and uh, the Sculpture School of the Royal College of Art in London. She received a, a scholarship to travel in Italy where she studied carving techniques. Uh, and in the 1930s, she married the painter Ben Nicholson. Uh, they were divorced in 1951. Uh, she visited uh, Paris twice, uh, saw works by Picasso, Brock, Arp, Modrian, Brancusi and uh, dedicated her uh, artistic output is primarily uh, abstraction. She began working directly in stone without a preliminary mo model, what is called direct carving. And um, usually the traditional work, if you're going to carve a statue, you think of Michelangelo, um, you know, he does lots of drawings. Um, he does uh, bozzetti, or little models out of clay. Um, and then, after you have the whole thing planned, you start carving. Um, in her case, uh, she you know, it was just get right into the statue, and uh, right into the block, and start carving away without all of the preliminary planning. So we see a little figure of a woman. Um, during World War II, um, she served, uh, during World War II, they sent uh, children, they took the children who were living in London and big cities, and they'd send them out to the countryside. Um, and they had nursery schools and things like that. Um, and so they were, they were put up with uh, families. Uh, so she's evidently involved with that, that effort uh, during the, the war. And of course this was to save the children from the bombings which were usually centered on the big cities. Uh, she didn't have much time to produce art during World War II. But in the 1950s she comes back and she becomes a very successful sculptor. sculptor. In the 1950s she comes back and she becomes a very success, successful sculptor. Um, she has many public commissions. Uh, she's exhibited at major exhibitions like the Fen uh, Venice Biano, uh, Biannual, <laughs> uh, the Grand Prix at Sao Paulo. Uh, and we're going to look at uh, some of her artwork now. Uh, this may be the most famous piece in the United States because it is in the United States and it's very large and it's uh, in New York City right outside of the United Nations building and so that's what you're seeing in the background. Um, it was installed in 1964. A lot of her work uh, has sometimes two names, you know, a single form, and that's like the abstract name, and then the Dag Hammarskjöld Memorial. So you can see this is a very large monolithic form, but it's irregular in shape. It's very simplified, but it swells out on one side. It has a pinnacle. And you'll notice the hole. We'll be talking about the hole. It is perforated. It is penetrated and allows you to see through it and what's on the other side. Uh, and that's a characteristic of most of her artwork. Um, this is another large monumental piece, four square walkthrough. 
in Cambridge University. And literally, like its name, uh, it has squares, and you can walk through it, and you can also see through it. So, again, it's perforated. She died in a studio fire in 1975, and uh, her studio is preserved as uh, the Hepworth Museum, or part of the museum, in St. Ives in, in uh, England. She's considered to be one of Britain's greatest sculptors and one of its most important abstract artists of any media. Her works create both these very abstract, very fluid forms, such as this sort of egg shape here, which is, is perforated and penetrated. Any of you who take 3D design, you probably have some kind of project where you have to create a sculpture. I think they usually do them in plaster, but you know, some kind of sculpture which is, uh, has holes through it, which is penetrated. Uh, and this owes to ba Barbara Hepworth. Uh, she creates both organic shapes, as you can see here, uh, and geometric shapes, and you know, the angular forms, the kind of uh, monolithic forms that you're seeing on the right. She is the first person uh, to have introduced the whole into English sculpture. Uh, now, that doesn't sound like a whole lot, does it? You, know, you just put a hole through it. But think about it. When you usually think about works of art, we usually think of them as a solid form. Um, you can't imagine putting a hole right in the middle. I was going to say of a Rodin. Maybe I can. But, <laughs> but of a, a Michelangelo or a Benini, uh, unless it's, it's part of, a, say, a drapery that you, you know. This is uh, part of the idea of having the play between solids and voids. Um, so this is one of the very early works uh, per, from 1931, pierced form, which has been destroyed in World War II. Uh, and the whole becomes a very uh, important contribution, contribution to modern sculpture. Uh, it has that idea, as we said, of, of something penetrating. Uh, it also has the idea of being able to look through and you have air, <laughs> uh, contrasted to the solidity of the shape. Uh, you have an outside and an inside. And she's often curving these shapes uh, so they, they lead, uh, at lead and lean uh, from one space to another. Um, the positive shape of the uh, solid form, whatever material and the uh, negative shape of not only the surrounding air, but also what we can see through the holes, through the perforations. Uh, and she uses a lot of different materials for these. Uh, so you have uh, wood and stone, and different things. Um, I know when I was in school, uh, they did mention Henry Moore, because he's the male artist who has a hole. Uh, and he is influenced by Hepworth. They were fellow students at, Le at Leeds. And a year after Hepworth started putting holes through her sculpture, uh, Henry Moore started putting holes through his sculpture. Uh, uh, one of the differences between them, they both have these very fluid, curving shapes, is that uh, Hepworth's work, she did some figural work when she began, but almost all of her work is abstract. Uh, she starts with figures and it becomes abstract. She works with natural forms. Uh, as you can see here, Hepworth, a seated figure, and uh, Henry Moore, uh, where you have a reclining female figure, uh, abstract form. Uh, you see much more of the figure in it. You can see the figure in both of them, but uh, Hepworth's is, is uh, perhaps even more abstracted. And some things, of course, are completely abstracted. This is called Three Forms. It's at the Tate Gallery. Uh, it's just absolutely simple. And, you know, minimalism, we think of that as, a, what, 19, I have to get my 20th century people to tell me, but uh, 70s, 80s. Uh, she's doing minimalism long before there's minimalism. <laughs> uh, just this the slightly different shapes sort of the elongated shapes and then the perfect circle all on this rectangular uh, marble. And uh, part of it becomes the lighting. You can light this so many ways, so you can have reflections, uh, you can have shadows. Oval sculpture, we've looked at that before. Uh, 
with the, the, the uh, curving sides. And here, you know, it almost uh, very, very thin uh, membrane that separates the two holes. A sculpture with color. So she's adding some outside elements and uh, adding color to the inside of that. I think that's just beautiful. <laughs> uh, Pegalus. Um, Pel ah, how do you pronounce that? I'm not sure how you pronounce it. I don't speak Greek. Um, Pelagus. Uh, it's Greek for sea. And I did, once again, this happens a lot. I will find two sources with two different uh, dates. So somewhere between 1946 and 1948. Uh, these are forms uh, that seem to be suggested by nature. They're very organic forms. You might think of a shell uh, that curves in and of us, around itself. And, uh, and then here's a, another work, which is a figure old but no figures. Uh, it reminds you, it's called Concourse. You know, it looks like people in the, <laughs> people at the, what, the airport, you know, milling around waiting for their planes or something like that. But none of them are really figures. They're all these wonderful abstract shapes. Oh, little scene there. And this was actually inspired by the interaction of people and architecture in the Piazza San Marco in Venice. Uh, but I noticed she doesn't have San Marco. She doesn't have the, the uh, there's a, a loggia, sort of uh, arcade uh, uh, with uh, shops behind it. So she's not really showing the architecture. She's showing just you know, people milling around, only they're not really people. It's kind of whimsical, actually. Uh, you can see this here in, uh, two different lighting uh, techniques. One where it's very dramatic lighting, uh, and the other where you can pretty much make out all the forms. Uh, the material was, you know, something I guess that was going to be thrown out. It was uh, from a mantelpiece in her neighbor's house. And she could use it. Um, she's also known for these uh, figural, and once again, I use the word loosely, but, uh, you know, these, these um, abstract shapes that suggest figures. Uh, she calls them menhirs. And uh, so there's just two figures. And this is made out of teak. Uh, and the sculpture is very abstract, but they suggest figures. I'm not sure, do they have gender? Is the other male and female figure here? <laughs> uh, well, I'll let you decide. Um, and she, as once again, she uses all different kind of materials, different kinds of stones, uh, different kind of woods, and uh, some in bronze. Here's one in slate where you have the two figures. These are figures that are created from wood, beautifully polished and perforated. Uh, another figure, and as we said, she often has these sub, uh, subtitles, Archean. Uh, the Archean period was the time when Earth, uh, when the Archean period, uh, geographically, was when uh, life first appeared on Earth. So this is uh, primal life, in a sense. It's, uh, uh, it seems figural. Uh, it's uh, very textured and pitted. Uh, you know, the, the, the feeling of almost like a fossil. So it suggests, rather than reproduces, uh, some uh, early life form. Uh, here, the, uh, the circle is broken, and you have a, almost a kind of U-shape with the wonderful uh, curving forms. Trevolgan, the title that she gives to this work of art, is a hill near her home in St. Ives in Cornwall in, in England. And uh, it's, you know, it, it's a shape that suggests nature, it's organic, it's curving. Uh, without it reproducing exactly something. It's kind of interesting because it's almost the exact opposite of a hill uh, in, in the sense it's a kind of U-shaped form. Uh, but this is how she describes the hill. And you can see how this relates to the form of the artwork. The cliffs divide as they touch the sea facing west. At this point, facing the setting sun across the Atlantic, where sea and sky blend with the hills and rocks, the forms seem to enfold the watcher and lift him toward the, towards the sky. So you can see that this, for, this form of the sculpture seems to uh, 
bend around as though it were to enfold something in the middle. And uh, the, the forms are uplifting. They're, they're pointing upward almost. Um, of course, I'm, you know, I do a lot of, I, to a lot with medieval art, and I think of the Oran figure, or the Oran figure, the praying figure from early Christian art, which has uplifted hands, uplifted arms. Um, this is just icon. It's uh, made out of mahogany, and the shapes are very, very simple, uh, but very, very beautiful. Um, you can you can see how the inside is sort of uh, tapered in, beveled in. And uh, it has you know, sort of a large cutaway form, and then go to a smaller form. You just have to uh, realize that you could look at this from many different points of view and, and see it in many different ways. And so here we have uh, different points of view. And, and who would have known that these big cutouts were on the other side? Um, this one has a the sort of historical name, I guess, a Minoan head. Uh, Obviously, what it is is a very simple uh, form that almost suggests a head. And uh, the Minoan civilization, of course, around 1500 BCE, uh, was a civilization on Crete. And it's, it, it's left artifacts um, and even written records. Unfortunately, we can't read. It has two languages, and we can't read uh, one of the languages. Uh, so there's a lot of questions about uh, the Minoans. So this becomes very, in a sense, archaic, uh, long ago, mysterious uh, image. And uh, this, uh, we've seen this before, these uh, geometric forms uh, in uh, a site, uh, on, in a landscape outside. And uh, it's called Conversations with Magic Stones. So she really creates magic, in a sense, with her artwork.